get involved. It is an interactive workshop. Um, it's my great pleasure and honour to introduce not only uh, our, our guest speaker and, and my guest for the day um, in this facilitation, but also um, a great man that I've had the pleasure of knowing for quite a while. So um, Gareth uh, Benson, guys, is a qualified intellectual property and commercial lawyer. I think a number of you probably checked him out prior to the event, and I know a few of you have spoken to him prior as well. Um, he's been doing this since 2010, has been assisting, especially in the entrepreneur space. So he's part of the entourage community and has been in a, some way, shape or form, literally since we began many, many years ago. Um, in 2012, actually, he was the runner up in the Entourage Pitch Competition, ironically. So, um, and he has joined now the Entourage as a, uh, as a full-time member, um, but he's been a, a great supporter of, uh, of entrepreneurs, especially in the intellectual property space and helping them um, leverage the power of their ideas. Um, he's a boy from the bush, making it into the big city. He's trying to take my line, but the simple boy from Moody Ponds. So it's the boy from the bush and the boy from Moody Ponds meet each other. A little bit of the, um, a little bit I'll tell you as well, guys, uh, that's not in his bio. He's been a great supporter of my, uh, my philanthropic work um, over in uh, Cambodia and also been involved in uh, <clears throat> some of the youth work we do in Australia with Project Gen Z. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to just say a massive thank you publicly to, uh, to Gareth and appreciate everything that you have done, mate. Um, the format for today, guys, and then I'll hand it over to Gareth is to, uh, to probably spend the next um, 35 to 40 minutes going through some solid content with you. Um, he's gone to the, the, the absolute um, lengths of not only putting together some amazing content, which is available for you post the event. If you would like, you can um, email Gareth directly and he can um, organise that for you. But you'll also be getting a work um, sheet that will allow you to do just a, a, a basically a quick checklist on what works and what doesn't work, um, you got what's working, what's currently not working in your uh, business from an intellectual property point of view and protection point of view, um, but also then where the opportunities are to really sort of leverage what you've created so far and, and, and beyond. Um, it will be a complimentary session that you can log in for a one-on-one -on -one, uh, complimentary obligation free session with um, with Gareth. Uh, I'll also put, a, put up a link for a, anyone who's not um, an existing Entourage member and would like to know a little bit more about the Entourage, I'll put up a link at the end. They can book in a session with myself also. Um, today, we also have uh, Leonardo Chi. Leo, do you want to just give us a wave and introduce yourself? He's my business manager, guys. He will be helping moderate the day uh, or the session. And so anything you need, um, just you can ask Leo directly or put it in the com comments. And, Leo, do you want to just introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. So I was born in Korea, raised in Brazil. Had the opportunity to meet Morello here in Australia. Has been working, working with him for the last four years and a half as his business manager. And yeah, a lot of learning and hope we have a great session today. Beautiful. Bit of love for Leonardo Chi, guys. Three, two, one. Beautiful. Guys, I'm just going to get everyone to do a couple of quick things before I pass it over to Gareth as well. If you could just put your name, your full name and your uh, your business or, or your full name and maybe where you're from as well in the little comments in the chat section on the right hand side or wherever you've got your chat set up, that will, that will go down well. Um, and also on the little reactions page, uh, on the little reactions buttons at the bottom, um, you've got, if you click on that, you can do a little either thumbs up. You can see a little virtual thumbs up or a hands up there. So if you want to put your hand up to ask a question, we can do that. It is an interactive session. You don't need to wait till the end to ask questions. You can uh, ask questions at any point. Um, so feel free to, uh, to chime in and do that. Um, you can do it physically as in just put your hand up like that physically and let people know, let us know that you want to ask Gareth a question, either myself, Leo or Gareth. We'll, um, we'll trigger you to do that or just, put, as I said, put your little virtual hand up and you can do that too. Beautiful. Um, so guys, without further ado, the, uh, the boy from the bush who's made it in the big city, um, IP, uh, a lawyer extraordinaire uh, from IPSC, it's my great honour and privilege to uh, pass it over to the man, the legend, Mr. Gareth Benson, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Andrew. And it's great to see so many uh, faces, new faces actually, as well as um, some, some kind friends and colleagues who are also on the call. Um, yes, it is a great pleasure to be, uh, to, to be welcomed home to the Entourage, um, having been a supporter of entrepreneurship in Australia for uh, almost a decade and been on the journey with the Entourage in, in really uh, assisting others 
to fulfill their uh, their highest expression of their identity, which is what I uh, refer to as intellectual property. I am a commercial and intellectual property lawyer and my entrepreneurship journey began probably like uh, a few people on the call, probably. Uh, I see we've got a lot of consultants here and, uh, and there's others in property and events management, which is awesome. It's really great to have a rich and varied uh, different vocations on the call. But my uh, journey began uh, in 2002 when I qualified to become a lawyer and joined the corporate world. And uh, from then on, I was, uh, was um, uh, found that I, 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 was, I was quickly trying to find my way out. And, uh, and that's where I actually saw the value of intellectual property, not only as a, a practitioner, as, a, uh, as, a, um, as an IP specialist, but also in someone that's backed their own ideas. And that's certainly been my journey through the last 10 years uh, as well. It's helping others uh, fulfill their uh, entrepreneurial ambition uh, through the power of their intellectual property, but also I've run a uh, content management uh, or uh, yeah, marketing and digital manage, uh, marketing company. And also I've got a uh, in real interest and a passion for education, which has led us here um, to uh, offer this uh, masterclass, which Andrew said, you know, will happen in, uh, there'll be two, two main components. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a uh, content to begin with. Uh, it's really a one-on-one -on, -one on intellectual property. Uh, so you've got a, a really solid understanding of some of the, the key areas of intellectual property. Um, and that's, uh, uh, as Andrew said, is about the first 20, 25 minutes. And then the second half, we're actually gonna apply it. Now, um, did everyone receive an email from me yesterday just uh, containing an IP worksheet? Okay, that's really good uh, if you have. If not, I think uh, that's great. Yeah, a couple of thumbs up, that's great. Um, I, it was just as a courtesy to you to just to have an outline uh, of actually what's going to be discussed as part of the presentation today. It, you know, on those two sheets, um, it's basically you can print it back to back uh, at a later stage or even open it if you've got a Gmail account into a uh, Doc Hub account and you can actually make notes as you go. Uh, the idea is in the second half, we'll just have a little bit of workshop time. Um, and what we're going to actually then do is actually discuss everything you've learned about intellectual property in the context of your own business. I feel that the power is really not only in the knowledge that you can acquire, but it's, it's in its application. So when you, like Gretchen, who's on the call, you mentioned she's got an idea. When you begin to apply that, uh, the framework of intellectual property to your own ideas or your own business, you're going to walk away from this session with a much stronger understanding of the power of your own intellectual property. And that's what this is all about. It is about the power of your ideas. So on that note, I might just start the slides here because I really just want to get into the content. This is about intellectual property and your business. Um, intellectual property is your business. Many of the consultants who are on the call will recognize that their ideas are, are, um, are sometimes some of their most valuable assets. It's what they sell their time for. Um, in fact, and we've seen with Andrew, you know, he uh, was, of course, uh, the winner of the first Australian Apprentice in 2009, and he was recognised uh, for his ability to uh, back his own ideas and create entrepreneurial uh, opportunity out of that. Likewise, many of you on the call are in the business, actually, of intellectual property. You are selling your ideas uh, and you're selling your time as a consultant. And therefore, it's really important to just understand a little bit of the framework around intellectual property. So you can also apply as in the entourage or Jack Delosa's, you can actually work on your business by actually strategically planning how you can actually use your intellectual property, your vital ideas uh, better. And uh, essentially at the end of the day, or well, the objective of today's session is so you can walk away with actually um, uh, coming up with more of a, a, an idea of a, uh, creating a strategy around your intellectual property. That's the most in, important giveaway that I, I want or wish to impart today. It's really about uh, having a strategy around your intellectual property and understanding the nuts and bolts of that uh, within, of course, a legal context, because that is my background. Um, but let's start where most great things begin, and that is through the power of story. And um, just to share with you, uh, actually, just to actually do a little bit of a quiz as to, uh, uh, as to what your understanding of intellectual property might be, 
I'm going to introduce this session. I'm a big lover of film. Um, as I said, I've, I've worked, uh, I've started digital marketing or video content agency, and I previously worked for SBS Television. I have a secret that I'd like to share with you. I'm an a, a, a undercover filmmaker. I, I, I love making film and I love the film industry. And so I'd just like to begin this, this, this discussion around intellectual property with this quiz question. What kind of intellectual property is this? Um, you can all see that on the screen. Is that right, Andrew? You can all yep. see that. Uh, what kind of intellectual property is this and who owns it? Maybe just put in the chat box uh, there just to begin. What kind of intellectual property this could be and who owns it? Just give you a moment there just as I see some, uh, some answers coming through. Okay. I can't actually read that. Can you read out a few, Andrew, actually? Would you uh, yeah, we got Scott, Scott McLean says uh, trademark. Anthony Morello says trademark. Uh, who owns it, guys? Uh, right. Tish is saying trademark copyright and the studio owns it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Look, the, uh, that's fantastic answers and fantastic answers. And that, that answer is absolutely correct. This is, uh, you know, Andrew's business partner's name's Leo. This is actually Leo the Lion. Leo the Lion has been a powerful tra trademark for almost a hundred years. It is owned by MGM Studios. And in the golden age of Hollywood, Leo was recognized as, um, as the trademark symbol of, of MGM, one of the big powerhouse studios of the golden age of Hollywood. It was a very powerful trademark, a very powerful brand. And in fact, there was a story that went with it. I mean, Leo the Lion actually existed, was a mascot of MGM. And actually, uh, I was fascinated over the weekend to be watching a documentary about this period of time and saw that Leo actually, um, you know, he was the live lion. And when uh, film moved from, the, from uh, the silent era into the talkies era, people were just, you know, they were just absolutely enraptured by Leo who would roar You've probably seen it at the beginning of any film. But, um, and uh, Leo actually survived a, even a plane crash, I found out too, by the way, um, which was an interesting part of the backstory of the trademark. But it's a very, what's more, most important in business, as much as the story is, is that MGM still owns the, uh, the right and title to this trademark um, and, and indeed the image of Leo the Lion. And it just shows you the power of branding, which we will touch on in trademarks as a component. And uh, look, one of the things, just to fully acknowledge the times that we're living in, you know, with COVID-19, I'm, I'm from Melbourne, but we're broadcasting, you know, across Australia and nothing's changed here. We're simply in the midst of disruption everywhere, um, every week. And uh, one of the things that I'd really like to, to, to also for you to note down is that disruption has always been there and disruption is the best time to create opportunity. In fact, I over the weekend was loving a documentary on called uh, America in Colour and it was really about the, uh, the hundred years of cinema and how Hollywood was created. Um, and just to relating this back to intellectual property, it was actually Thomas Edison who was one of, one of the founding fathers of cinema. Edison set up the first movie studio called Black Mariah in 1893 using his patented kinetoscope. And uh, this actually was used to actually show really short animated um, snippets that became known as Nickelodeons. In fact, he then not only conceived the invention and improved it over a period of time, but he also patented it. And as a businessman, he exploited it uh, with respect to his own intellectual property. And this was really that Edison was one of the most prolific uh, painters actually in American history. American business history and um, and his estate still goes to show that you can be creative, you can actually create some incredible ideas. And if you have a great concept of how intellectual property works, you can actually commercialize them for great success. In 1895, he, he, he formed the first story, which was called The Great Train Robbery. And, and this was the key for him. He actually started selling that in shop fronts. So shop fronts were, act, were actually licensed his patented kinetoscope and, that, and then they would, people would start coming to the shops, coming to these shop fronts uh, to actually uh, at the birth of cinema. 
By 1907, over 2 million Americans were heading to the movies and rival studios were springing up on the West Coast. Edison then set up a motion picture patent company and these uh, proprietors enforced their intellectual property rights in both shooting and exhibiting films in the front uh, sections of shops. And it was incredibly successful for those eight producers because these are the gentlemen that were there at the beginning of, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the age of cinema. It was not the golden age, however. And not many people know this part of the story, but I want to share with you it because it really is how industries are continually being disruption, disrupted. From Edison's patented picture company, it was actually a lot of the other filmmakers, clearly there were two million people. There were many more people that, that really were enthusiastic about um, being part of this industry. And it took one gentleman by the name of David Griffith to head over to California, to sunny California, which offered sunshine all year round and, um, uh, and a, uh, a great landscapes to actually um, renegade against these other uh, filmmakers and, and shot one film in 1910 called In Old California, right? And this was the first film to be shot is what is now known as Hollywood. It was then 1912 where some other filmmakers, Carl Lenley formed Universal Studios, which has now been a powerhouse for over a hundred years alongside other studios such as MGM. And they created, um, you know, the, the beginning of this suburb known Hollywood, which was all built around film production. And the rest, my friends, is history. It then gave birth to a, an industry that lasted for well over 100 years and still in some elements going strong. Uh, and um, by 1915, 26 million people, about the population of Australia, were all um, visiting film. And it gave birth to this enormous industry. Okay. Edison's monopoly was broken by that stage. It was ruled that he could no longer have the entire rights to uh, patent all the technology. New technology emerged and the studio system was born. This was a powerful business model, um, which, which, uh, which, which we, as we know and we've all grown up on, was really uh, about intellectual property, about the foundations of intellectual property and also new opportunities giving rise to new ideas. And this has now changed forever. The end of this story actually will likely end around 1997 when Netflix was created. This has now disrupted the Hollywood system forever. Now the, the, uh, the streaming, uh, streaming service providers are the ones that are actually producing films. Uh, and uh, we're seeing a lot of vacant lots in Hollywood. Uh, even you know Tom Hanks' new film last week that was called Greyhound, was, was to be made for the cinema, but end up being released by Apple TV and, and purchased by Amazon Prime because we're the way we're consuming media has changed forever. The real point of this story, is, ladies and gentlemen, is that disruption is an opportunity and it's about the power of new ideas. And in some ways, while we are incredibly challenged uh, by COVID-19, this is the time great ideas are born. And really, it begins with understanding, like Edison did at the very beginning of the movies, movies uh, about the power of your intellectual property. So enough of that. And now let's get into some bread and butter. What is intellectual property and how can it relate to you uh, and your business? Well, let's begin with one of the es essential definitions of the term. IP Australia, which is the government arm of uh, the agency that manages uh, the registration of intellectual property in Australia, uh, defines along, the world, along with the World Intellectual Property Organisation, this as an area of law which enables people to earn recognition or financial benefit from what they invent or create. An easy definition or an easy way to understand it, it's basically the property of the mind or, or, or of intellect or intellect, which in other words, just means your ideas. And what IP Australia does is, uh, as it does in many other common law countries, it provides a, a mechanism for recognizing um, uh, the creations of individuals um, uh, to actually uh, obtain proprietary ownership of their ideas. And it's become very, very important over the last several hundred years through authorship. It began actually in the 1600s with the Statute of Anne, where it recognised authors at the time of the printing press. Authors were, were, uh, were seen to have a legal right to their ideas, and as they should. And guess what? 
nothing has changed. You, as a small business owner, as an entrepreneur, or as, a, as a, or, or, or behind the helm of a, of a growing organization, all of you have the power uh, to actually empower yourself by understanding the power and of your commercial, uh, the commercial worth of these ideas. And a lot of it begins on the foundation uh, of understanding what intellectual property is. Basically, intellectual property is your business. And that's where beginning in the 1600s through the Statute of Anne to today, in a very changing marketplace, in a changing world where technology is bringing new ideas uh, quicker to market and we all have to pivot and change quickly as COVID has, um, has uh, forced us all to do, um, really understanding the power of ideas means that you will be a step ahead uh, in your entrepreneurial journey. So let's begin on the ground floor. So you are all building a solid business of your ideas. And that begun, begins with an understanding of what copyright is. Perhaps um, we could have a, a, couple of, uh, a couple of ideas in the chat box, if you like, just as, uh, as we go, of what your understanding of copyright is. Andrew, I don't actually have access to the chat I'm box. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll commentate. I'll yeah, commentate thanks, so. yeah, thanks, buddy. What are come, some of those ideas? What, what do you believe copyright is? Um, apply it to your own business, if you like, too. Uh, Gretchen says protection. Copyright is the basis of protection, yeah. Right. Uh, Mark and Michelle, legal protection of your own information. Yeah, that's yeah. that's right. Yeah. Fantastic. Maybe just one more. One more, guys. Uh, and Scott McLean says uh, copyright, the protection of design, theory, and creation. Hitesh says it linked to protection of software code tag lines written content yes all of those things are wonderful uh wonderful answers because copyright encapsulates all of that and much more oh i'll let you know as well lorna um welcome lorna i don't think we had a chance to meet you before so lorna from wow group uh has said plus adding value to your business and mark and michelle um also mentioned gives owner exclusive rights that's absolutely correct. Yes, no, wonderful answers there. Essentially, uh, copyright is your identity and it is everything, for, as Hitesh mentioned, uh, it is data, the data that within your business, software business, you know, it's, it's your website copy. It is your, basically, it is your, the, right, uh, the right to copy uh, and it, that's what copyright means, but it also is, is essentially your identity. Here's a couple of examples on the screen there. It can be everything from your logo, uh, design, uh, whether you're in fashion, it can be about your software application or a software um, uh, that you're building for your business uh, or you know, any of the creative content. In fact, copy, the easiest way to understand copyright is copyright is like oxygen. We are breathing it in and breathing it out every day. In fact, in a digital world, it's more relevant than ever. If has, hands up anyone that's so or thumbs up for anyone who's shared a, a shared a Facebook post uh, in the last you know tw twenty minutes or uh, twenty four hours. The f the fact of the matter is you are sharing copyright right there, and um, and the way that the terms and condition of these platforms are now organised is that you're consenting if you're publishing like you are broadcasting uh, on this platform, you are consenting for it to be shared. And so that's just one of the ways copyrights changed in the last 15 years. Um, uh, but it's essential for us all to recognize that our intellectual property is our identity and IP is your business. Um, just a bit about the regulation of that. I mean, the, the Copyright Act 1968 is the most modern interpretation of what copyright is in relating to Australia. Uh, and it defines copyright as a bundle of economic rights, which gives the owner exclusive right to their own intellectual property it creates. So it's fundamentally about empowering you, empowering you uh, to have ownership around your ideas. The thing about copyright, as opposed to some of the other intellectual property rights we're gonna to explore today, is that it is actually automatic. So the copyright that might exist in your database, on your web copy, or in any of your plans or business plans or otherwise, it's protected automatically so it automatically is protected 
there is no need to register a work in an official register. If we went back even 100 years, or even actually 20 when there were people were writing, people would use, used to write a script, for example, and then send it off to the Writers Guild uh, as, a, as just to ensure that there was some sort of registry or right. And some of that still remains true. You, but thanks to the digital age, we can actually time, date, stamp uh, our documents, uh, our emails, uh, and even our web copy. The basic rule of thumb here, here's one of the first cut takeaways from today, is that the symbol, the copyright symbol, can be used uh, to notify um, the time or, or, or time or date of, of the existence of a piece of copyright. One of the things that I highly recommend for everyone on the call to do is to actually use the copyright symbol attached to your business name and put it on your website or next to your web copy. The reason being is that that then can, is a timestamp. If you are, um, say, the entourage, which began in 2010, I'm sure that they follow some of this process because I've seen some of the really polished material that the, the entourage create, is that they have been in existence since at least 2010. And anything that goes out can have the copyright, the name of the proprietary limited company, which is an Andrew Entourage, PTY, LTD, or something along those lines, 2010 to 2020. That's just another thing that everyone can use, putting your name, your business name, next to, every, uh, next to any, any official publication. Because it actually demonstrates that you actually are the author or creator of, uh, of years worth of, of intellectual property. And one of the, the reasons to do this is that it's very much about how you value your own ideas. Now, um, we have lived in a very bricks and mortar world and we still have that mentality which is born, it's carryover from the third industrial revolution. Not everything is bricks and mortar. In fact, um, our ideas are now valuable assets. And it, comes, it simply comes down to this. Using any of these techniques that I, I'm showing you here today in, in helping protect your intellectual property is effectively about putting up a gate. It's actually saying to people, I value my intellectual property. It is, has substantial worth. Um, and, um, and basically, by putting a copyright on it, um, like other mechanisms like patents, trademarks, or otherwise, you're basically saying to people, keep off the grass. If you left your um, front door open in Mooney Ponds, uh, uh, for example, Andrew, how long do you think it would be before someone came in and, 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 and stole your... your uh, your parents' uh, plasma screen. You know? Jeez, it's 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 Moody Bonds, Garrett. You 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 have thirty seconds, conscious. Yeah, thirty seconds. Right. Thirty seconds. Some some places might last a minute. No, but it's thirty yeah. seconds in Moody Bonds. Correct, right, thirty seconds. That's the reality, right? If you leave your gate, your front door open, you're inviting people to walk in, and you, the use of any of these mechanisms is basically about saying, you know, it's a gate. It's a gateway it's saying, I, I, I'm protecting my ideas. And that's really about, it's about empowerment. And that's one of the other things that I want, you, want to really pass on to you today. That yes, Gareth, of, yep. Sorry, Gareth, we've had a question. Sorry, sorry to interrupt yeah. you and Flo, but yep. Yep. Um, from D Hun, uh, uh, she's all the way over in the US. She said, are these items vastly different across the world or are they the same generally as she is based in the US? Okay, that's a great question. Where um, in the US are you? The, what's your name, sorry? Un, unmute yourself. What's your name? No, no, you just clicked. You clicked unmute and then you clicked mute again. Okay. There we go. <laughs> um, there we go. My name is Dia. Dia uh, is Dia. like minutes per day. And great. I'm in North Carolina. Right great. outside. Fantastic. Gareth. In Thank you answer. so much for that. Yeah, I've seen you've written, uh, written a question there too. And warm welcome to you um, over a warmer part of the world right now. Well, I'm from Melbourne and it's very cold down here. But anyway, look, at the end of the day, it's good to see uh, a great question and uh, a very relevant one. While we're, we're uh, really focused on Australia here, the, the fact of the matter is whether you're growing a business from the States and bringing it to Australia or growing a business in Australia and taking your products and services to the States, one of the good news is, is that there is, uh, in any common law country, which is America, England, UK, and, and uh, you know, there, there is a really, really strong understanding. A lot of the precedents 
cover the same ground. Uh, and the intellectual property rights systems do translate. In fact, uh, there is an organization which was founded in Geneva called the World Intellectual Property Organization, which uh, actually last century had a treaty called the, uh, there's, a, there's several treaties actually, which performed the reciprocal protection of intellectual property rights for any country that is part of that treaty. So in the areas of trademarks, for example, is known as the Madrid Protocol. If you grow a very uh, a big brand, let's call it Burger King, and then you bring that business to Australia, normally the Madrid Protocol would respect the intellectual property rights, the trademark um, of uh, Hungary uh, of Burger King, and uh, and then have it recognised here. Um, however, what actually happened with that particular trademark is that it was already protected by a small fish and chip shop in Queensland by the name of Burger King. And in that case, the reciprocal rights were not honored and, and, and they had to change their name. Um, and that's why in Australia, Burger King is actually known as Hungry Jacks. The reason I give you this story is that normally speaking, that if, you, uh, if a name hasn't been taken in another country, you can actually move, your trademark will be protected if you seek international protection through uh, the, the World Econ uh, Intellectual Property Organization and the Madrid Protocol. Copyright, trademarks, patents, all of these uh, are very well recognized commercial rights in the States as they are in England and indeed in Europe. Uh, and in mo even many Asian countries, China is a difficult area, which I won't get into today. But um, the, the short answer to that question, it's not a Commonwealth country, but it is a common law country. Um, Gretchen, uh, by the way, common law means that common law dates all the way back to the UK and the US and Australia all to have a common law rights, okay? Now that they all operate in their own jurisdictions, but we have a long history that goes back to case law, goes all the way back to the UK and US law is based on that. The World Intellectual Property Organization actually brings together um, all these different uh, intellectual property re regimes uh, and uh, the strategy, which is what we're here to discuss, the strategy is always register in your home country and then take it to the uh, international country that you're seeking to uh, commercialise in. But we can get into a bit more of that in the q and I'll uh, continue on the way, but thanks for those questions and comments. Um, I'll continue on the way. Um, on my slides again. I'm going to jump to this one because it's a bit user friendly. Okay, so we were talking copyright. Okay, I want to cover these rights so we have ample time to apply to. So let's just move on from copyright as basically it's a fundamental right. Copyright exists in, um, in your business. Now, while we're talking about uh, registrable rights, one of the areas that uh, Thomas Edison uh, who was based in the States, um, but monopolized his inventions on a global scale, was through the power of patents. I've got even a U US design patent there for a Adidas shoe, I believe it is. Um, the bandwagon hats, um, engineering, uh, the engines, uh, patents basically uh, for well over a century uh, are a legally enforceable right for a device, substance, method or process. Basically, a patent is a, a registrable right, which means unlike copyright, which has automatic protection, a, a patent can, uh, you can actually uh, apply for it to be registered uh, with the patents office. Every country has its own patent office and we have one here in Australia as well. And basically, um, a patent will assist you protect a new and inventive step, okay? Uh, the, the basic rule around patents is that it has to have a new utility or it's a new inventive step. Okay, now certain things can be patented more successfully than others. Usually a patent involves a new method of manufacture, for example, in pharmaceuticals, or a new and inventive step in terms of engineering. Uh, but one of some of the things that are difficult to patent include business processes. It's difficult to, to, uh, for that to actually get a, a registration. 
And there are three kinds of patents that should also be, uh, you should also be aware of too. You know, most people think of the Edison style of patent, which is known as a standard patent, a worldwide patent over an invention. But there are actually two other kinds that are available um, depending on which country you're coming from. But in Australia, I'm just gonna speak through the provisions uh, so the perspective of Australia. There's three you need to be aware of. There's the provisional patent. Now this, this uh, is, a, is, is an, uh, a useful step in strategy. A provisional patent can be protect an idea and can set a priority date. Um, it's for also the early on stages of um, exploring an idea. It is valued by investors uh, and can actually convert uh, to a much stronger patent which lasts a longer period of time. The benefits of a provisional patent is that it lasts uh, up to 12, uh, 12 months. So it's really for the early inception of an idea. One of the reasons to use this patent if you're on a pathway of growth in your business and you've got a unique um, uh, new invention is that you can actually use it for fundraising purposes. A provisional patent is relatively cheap to, uh, to uh, actually, um, to actually uh, have drafted and once you've actually got it registered with IP Australia, you will achieve the benefit of actually being able to use a patent pending um, evaluate, uh, patent pending label to your business and your idea. That has, uh, uh, is attractive to investors. Because again, going back towards the gate, the gate to your castle is your ideas. Having a provisional patent sets up that gate, shows that you've got something of value and means you can actually put it on your uh, on an asset register and even in a separate IP holding company that will go too far down that road today. But basically you're actually, you be able to use that strategically to raise funds and also to demonstrate that you've got a valuable idea. This can then be converted after a 12 month period into either an innovation patent. Okay, now this is uh, a new-ish, uh, a relatively new area because in the area era of technology and digital, a standard patent for 25 years is not necessarily going to cut it for everything. Um, in fact, um, some businesses and industries are going to be born and die within eight years in the future. Um, you know, all the future of work and education, um, uh, thought leadership demonstrates that we're going to move very quickly from the next 10 years onwards. And that's where an innovation patent can become useful. This doesn't have a stricter test as the standard patent, which is a new inventive step. This is a test around a new innovative step. So for example, uh, an innovative step doesn't need to be, have to be a major breakthrough. It can be just an innovation. For an example, software application. For example, um, Apple has been prolific in patenting some of its uh, technology because it creates a new utility, such as the App Store or, uh, or certain apps create a function, which is an innovative step. You know, Canva, which is a, a, an Australian born um, success story, unicorn success story, provides a new uh, innovative technology around graphic design, which empowers you know, entrepreneurs and business owners um, to, uh, to come up with fresh ideas and, and, uh, and integrates with social media. This would be an example of an innovative step and a patent can be acquired over those lighter steps, okay? I don't wanna to get too bogged down, but I just want you to have a basic understanding of what patenting and the reason for it. And then there are some very, very important um, reasons for that. Once you've got an asset, which is a patent, you can license it. In fact, that's what a lot of apps do. A lot of software applications do. You are licensing the right for others to use that. Um, or in, in some cases, some business cases, your entire organizations, such as Microsoft, just a small little company there, licensing uh, their rights um, to use uh, their patented software uh, for major commercial benefit. Now, some people have a, a varied view of this. Is it worth it, is it not? My one line answer for this is that it's just important to have an understanding of it and to have an IP strategy of it, around it. And just one cautionary tale here about the reasons why patenting or protecting any of your intellectual property is important. We uh, here in Australia, we're actually instrumental in coming up with some of the cornerstones of the uh, technology, which is now wireless, uh, the magic that brings the internet to your living room. 
the Wineland technology was created by a group of Australian inventors uh, and developed in the 90s. Uh, however, uh, and now the Wineland technology that is now uh, instrumental in any uh, modem is in, uh, you, you brought, brings the wireless now to the world. Now, this cautionary tale begins with CSIRO. I've worked for this organization, is a wonderful organization based on science and research. And scientists I love and, and have a real fascination with science myself. However, working for a scientific research organization, I can tell you the threshold around intellectual property protection was really about this thin. Um, and in fact, in the case of this technology, and um, the science for the science is good, um, which is very much the mentality of, of many scientists, let's create, let's not protect, um, led to this uh, technology escaping to the States and it was commercialized and patented in the United States. Uh, and a billion dollar lawsuit later, finally recognition was returned to the original inventors, but not without letting the core elements of this intellectual property escape. And this technology, this one piece of technology alone, could have made Australia uh, born an entire industry here in Australia. But it didn't because it wasn't protected and it escaped. And this is just one of the tales around uh, the reasons why you should, as an individual business owner, value the protection of your most vital asset, which is your ideas. So let's move on. Um, move along now to another and more exciting or as exciting um, area of intellectual property protection. And this one, everyone on the call should be able to relate to. We heard it from Leo the lion at the beginning, the MGM trademark. Um, you know, MGM, uh, Paramount, Universal, all of these were powerhouse um, uh, trademarks that have an incredible value. Um, one closer to home that everyone in Australia should recognise is the infamous Ugg boot. Now the Ugg boot was a was actually uh, uh, is it should have been an Australian trademark. It's another tale, a cautionary tale here. I'm starting with, but basically a trademark is a name, designation, logo, or logo that is used to identify a brand or product and a service. And while I'll, I'll tell the story about Ugg boots after the introduction, really the power of trademarks is greatly recognised by this man. Who who can write in the chat box a quick quiz uh, to make sure that you're all still here and with me. Who is this famous entrepreneur who is uh, actually from the UK? Um, a couple of answers there. Well, the standard answer is Richard Branson, but I was hoping someone would have something a bit more I, fun for me. I thought you were, you were going to say George Costanza. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Big Bird, Big Bird, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think Richard Branson is the George I was waiting Branson. for someone to give me something a bit more humorous. Yeah, yeah. Thank thought, you for the thought, Queenslanders thought, representing. I thought you hit it in the first. The know, man, the Max wrote the man. Yeah. Morello, successful Morello. brother. Scott yeah, Morello, <laughs> successful brother. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Was that by your brother? <laughs> no, that was by Scott McLean. That wasn't by my cousin either. We okay, go. well, listen, that's that's all great. Um, I'm sure we've got a few from... Lorna wrote granddad. <laughs> that's your granddad, Morello's granddad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it wouldn't be surprising if you were related. Yeah, yeah related to somewhere down the line. So we all hail from, you know, he's the Italian version. Of the, <laughs> um, Pretty sure we all hail from Africa originally, yeah, Gareth. Yeah, so that's there we go, so. Yes, that's the, the, probably all, all of this is true. And there is no wrong or right answers because we've been, uh, the indigenous people of this country have been uh, uh, some of the most famous entrepreneurs because they survived for 60,000 years. But this is the truth, right? We're all connected. And one of, the, one of the things that connects us all as human beings is the power of our ideas. And no one knows that more than anyone else, than, than, uh, as, a, as anyone else should, is, is Richard Branson. Because he has used the power of trademarks. He has actually 138 variations of the trademark Virgin. Uh, and they go into his many different businesses. Just a, a note on trademarks, as I uh, touched on with Steve, I think when uh, I, we had a quick chat about his trademark question, there are about 45 different uh, areas of products and services that can the trademarks can be registered in, uh, registered with IP Australia here in Australia. And even here in Australia, Sir Richard Branson has registered them in many different categories, everything from airlines to cola to music, 
uh, and all the way back, uh, or even boats and, uh, and cruise liners. So um, he, Richard Branson, uh, really understands the power of his own trademark because since the 1960s, he's created an incredible value in this, this name and brand. And he actually uses it strategically to enter new areas of business. And that is the power, ladies and gentlemen, of trademarks. And if anyone on that entrepreneurial journey or small business journey or enterprise journey knows that the power of their brand and, and really um, one of the number one takeaways from today is that you should be valuing your most visible asset, which is your brand. Uh, because this is what people purchase products and services. It's what has born great Australian businesses, leveraged the power of say the Yellow Brick Road, um, you know, which Andrews uh, had a relationship with, including through, um, through The Apprentice. Um, this is a powerful brand and um, we need to, as entrepreneurs, understand the power of our own branding and simply protect our most visible asset, uh, which is our, our, our brand. It's empowered under the Trademarks Act 1995. And as I mentioned before, it is used to indicate that goods or services come from a particular trader or services provider. It's not just your logo, or your branding. It can be a phrase, a tagline, a letter, a name, a signature, a numeric device, a logo, a color. Prince is a state registered a particular purple Pantone, by the way. And, this, and, a, and a very similar color, not the same Pantone, uh, has been challenged in the UK. Um, the color of Cadbury is uh, also trademarked. So this is the power of trademarks. It's really about uh, protecting your brand name. And one of the biggest misconceptions that I come across uh, in uh, business or otherwise is that many people think just because they've registered their business name, established a propriety, limited company, or they have the domain name, that they have the legal right to the name. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you actually, no, you do not. Unless you have a registered trademark, you do not have the power to use your own name in the marketplace. You do not have the legal right to use it. A domain is a license. You pay GoDaddy $10 a month or a year to use that domain name and you've got to renew it. That's called a license. Only a trademark gives you the full legal right and protection of your own name in the marketplace. So please, if you allow me to assist you, one of the big takeaways from today is that any business owner on this call should be investing in the power of protecting their own trademark. Andrew, you've got a story about this in the entourage, haven't you? Actually, I've got probably two two quick stories, and I'm vigilant of time. Want to make sure that we get um, all sure. get through the content. Um, uh, so, yeah. first of all, uh, Yellow Brick Road. Uh, I was there during the inception. Ironically, didn't even plan it. I'm holding a Yellow Brick Road pen today. <laughs> I don't even know where they came from. To be honest, true. Um, so. Um, we, Yellow Brick Road actually had uh, a number of trademarks right across the board, um, but then in in uh, the um, North Shore of Sydney, um, there was actually a real estate company called Yellow Brick Road Real Estate who, who traded as the McGraths in Neutral Bay, and um, you know Mark, you know at the very early days had to go and buy that off them, and they sold it to him but extorted him effectively, not ridiculous amounts, but um, Brent Nicholson, who Scott M McLean, McLean will remember, um, as, as Scott, um, Brent Nicholson had to go and negotiate. It was ironic Mark's choice of negotiating because Brent was quite a, um, quite a serious guy and he's not a relationship guy, but a great guy. He's a, he was our CTO at one stage, but um, he actually went Sorry. What was that, sorry? Ignore that. That was my computer. Okay, system. no worries. No worries. Um, and, and then the next thing, um, the next one was when we actually look, we're looking, the entourage is looking at expanding. So a little bit um, off record, guys, you're getting the, the intel. We're looking at expanding into the US markets and um, UK markets and, and Southeast Asia out through Singapore and so forth, forth over the next, you know, um, 12, 24, 36 months. And uh, so obviously when we did the rebrand last year, which a lot of you noticed and, and, and sent me messages saying that you really like the new rebrand and the, you know, the whole uh, imagery and everything that we obviously have trademarked. But um, we went to go and start just making sure before we did the rebrand that we were going to be able to utilize our brand in, in other, um, other places. And actually in America, ironically, 
um, the, 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 the television show, The Entourage, has gone and um, trademarked and patented uh, all of everything to do with The Entourage. They own The Entourage, um, uh, Entourage property, Entourage cars, Entourage. So this is the studio that owns or the production company that owns Entourage. They've gone and taken everything. Now, good news for us, and this is interesting to know, this is where you probably need to engage an expert at some point. Um, and as I said, Gareth is happy to just have an obligation for a complimentary chat with all of you, but it's probably worth engaging someone at some point um, uh, sooner rather than later, speaking to a professional such as Gareth or, or someone you know, um, is because when we went to go and uh, do the, um, the we, we thought we were going to need a rebrand. So we'd gone and spent money on um, on doing a rebrand, like a, a, like coming up with a whole new name, going to a creative agency. We probably wasted money on doing that because when we did seek the right advice, um, they explained that we had enough legs to stand on in the fact that, first of all, there was a lack of use by the people that own Entourage Education in, in America, which is the television show. Ironically, they uh, they don't use the they don't use that 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 trademark that they own. So there's a lack of use there, which we've been using it for a period of time. And the second thing was is that we had trademarked it in Australia prior to the television show being around. So we had shown the the time in length that we'd. Um, been utilising the brand and that we were utilising for a specific reason, which was education, which hadn't been utilised in America. Um, hence, we did a rebrand rather than a, than a whole new name change. So that's a little bit of a story about trademarking and also the power of engaging the right advice and, and, and trying to say, it actually saves some money in the medium to long term if you do that earlier rather than later. Yeah, well, that's right. You know, thank you for sharing that story because the entourage have, uh, you know, uh, grown a very uh, powerful brand and, and a very important one. Um, and, uh, and that's how, you know, every year it's gaining more value. And the, the thing about trademark protection is actually it's an asset that that can then be placed on the balance sheet. Traditionally, if you spoke to an accountant, I'm sure there's some accountants on the call, they know it as goodwill. Uh, but if, uh, if, if we even look back into the last 20 years of business, the value of intellectual property, including brands and trademarks, uh, used to know, you know, is generally 20% of the value of a business known as goodwill. Now we've got entire businesses around intellectual property and the power of the brands behind them. Uh, and, uh, and so the very least, uh, I think one of the other key takeaways today uh, is to actually investigate the protection of your intellectual property, but also most, first and foremost, uh, the power of your brand. Okay, just, just, on. just on those two, two things there, one, uh, a funny one, Scott McLean just wrote a comment, even though Morello, you live your life like that show. <laughs> you are a brand, you are a trademark. <laughs> no, there you go, um, but number two, uh, I will also mention what Gareth just mentioned there. And if you want to write this down, guys, this also adds to the potential of what we call strategic value, strategic value. So when it comes time for exit or capital raise, um, it is really, really important that these things are in place in order to establish a core foundation for strategic value. Yes, very important. Right. When you're selling a business, then you're going to be selling all the assets, including the brand. So many investors and others at that stage will actually look to see what you've done and they're like well you say your brand is worth this but you don't even have a trademark so it's really about intellectual property 101 is is protecting your brand so um and this is one of the things along with uh you know i'm offering today as part of uh, a one-on-one -on -one session um after after all of this uh is actually understanding a little bit more detail on how this applies to your own business. Uh, and that's why we want to get to this last last section now, because we, we just want to give you a taste for that. If many, if all of those people on the call could just uh, bring up their, um, the document that I sent through yesterday, which is the IP workshop uh, worksheet. Um, if you could just pull that up, because I'm going to refer to it now in this last, last uh, section. Um, fantastic. It's great to see some people printing them off, you know, um, that's wonderful. Good to see the preparation. Um, and by the way, I'm just popping in some links and juggling a few things here, but, uh, um, in some links just on, to finish on trademark protection, I've put a little section here on, on trademarks from IP Australia, but let's move on and uh, to this, this section now, and I'm sorry, I'm jumping around, but really I, we want to be, get to a stage of applying this knowledge. 
now that we've sort of had a one-on-one -on -one overview. Um, have I still got the, where's my share screen now? Have you got, let me just share that screen again, get back to the slides. Am I back on the slides? Yeah, your screen's up, yep. Right. You're not on the slides. I'm on the slides, we've got trademarks, right? Yep. Okay, why haven't I, why can't I see it? You guys can see it, I can't see it. Too many, too many screens. Okay, I'll, I'll just go without it, I think. Um, because what we want to go, so what we've done is we've covered on, uh, we've covered on copyrights, patents, trademarks, and I've got a short section at, actually at the end. What I'd like to do, just on those core areas, because I believe for many of the business owners on the call, that's what's going to be most important uh, to understand, have, have a basic understand. We do, is there any creatives on the call? You know, anyone that's in the area of fashion or, or manufacturing designs? If not, then I won't cover it. Okay, great. Because really that worksheet gives you um, about four or five key sections to begin your own analysis of the intellectual property in your business. And what, I want, what we want to do is actually give you about just five minutes here to actually make a couple of notes uh, on, there's a prompt at the, at the top of each, each part of that box and really look at you, what your business, your project or your enterprise may be, uh, what, what your business is and, and really just see if you can uh, come up with a few ideas, a few notes around what the copyright that exists in your business may be what the trademark of your business may be. That's an easy place to start, by the way. Um, I'll give you a hint there, big hint, um, the power of your brand and potentially any patents, okay? Patents, patentable subject matter, we call it. So if you're in tech, it could be software. If you're someone in the entourage that came up with this great idea around a, a, a technical device that could sit on counters and uh, warn when people come closer than 1.5 meters to a uh, cashier, for example. That would, was an interesting one. I'm not sure if that entourage member is on the call, but I encourage them to be here because I thought that was an interesting, potentially a patent. Um, it's a new uh, innovative, or at least, an, at least a new innovative step in, uh, in health and protection. You know, any of those kind of ideas, if you're in, in uh, there, um, you know, patents, that's another area. Okay. Um, so those three are the main areas, copyright, trademarks and patents. How about we give five minutes for, from now for people to actually just make a couple of notes and then we'll do a bit of sharing. You think Andrew? Yes. Yeah. Legendary. Uh, so, um, thanks Gretchen for just resharing that document in the comments. If anyone doesn't have it, they can go on there and click download. Oh yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. much thanks Gretchen. What will we do without the simple girls from Port Macquarie, eh? They can just make, make magic happen. Miss that place. That's great. So guys, don't, don't um, go, you know, don't stress too much on the detail right now. It's a matter of just sort of a bit of a, a, a you know, a uh, three to five minute brain dump. Um, yeah. If you've got any questions, if you've got a question, you yeah, can feel free to... Oh, ask a Mandy. question. Mandy's got one. Do you want to read that out? Uh, Mandy, I have invented a baby device that combines a number of existing technology features, but no new technology. No other product combine. Uh, no other product combine these combines these existing features in the same way. But lots of products in, in, that are existing with these features in other combinations. I have previously been told it's not worth the patent. What do you think? Okay, it's a good question. Great question. What, a baby device without giving away uh, soft copy, uh, Max. Um, I don't have a word copy at that handy, um, but uh, what I encourage you to do if you're on Gmail, open up your DocuHub, uh, which is free to use, and you can make notes directly uh, in that if you've got a Gmail account. Um, Sorry about not having printed a word version ready on the ready, but let's get to the question here, Mandy. Mandy, yep. uh, could you just answer a quick question? Uh, it's a baby device. I mean, look, um, not to give you can. I'm, I mean, I'm sure. Remember, intellectual property, broadly speaking, protects uh, 
the expression of ideas, not the ideas themselves. So you can reveal to us what the baby device is because it's really, whether it's patents, copyright, trademark, it's the expression of ideas that is protected uh, in whether it's the way that you write a screenplay in copyright or the unique Virgin brand in its red, uh, red and white colors or the Qantas logo in its red and white colors um, through to patents like Edison's you know, kinetoscope. These are all expression of ideas. So I just want to get an understanding, Mandy, of what that is, the, the baby device. If it is, say, for example, I mean, you know, I don't know if it's new technology, but one of the things that comes springs to mind here is that there's a, uh, one of the desperate housewives, while well, we've got the um, legendary apprentice, uh, winner of the apprentice, on the are you don't put are you don't be don't be putting me in that same category, mate. Oh, okay, no, as a <laughs> desperate housewife, I don't know. <laughs> You're a celebrity, um, definitely a minor one, um, Andrew. But basically, I, <laughs> um, I love the story of the boy from the birds making it big in the big Sydney. Um, but basically, one of the, the the housewives came up with an app, um, and it's been done re re relatively successfully. It's called Bub, right? And it, it is actually, uh, I think, it's a time management tool um, for mothers. Great new utility. That is may not be patentable subject matter. It's new technology. Uh, it, sorry, to just to clarify there, it is patentable subject matter, but it may not qualify for a full standard patent because it's not a new inventive step. Instead, what it could be is a new innovative step, okay? Because Bub is not the first time management software to be produced, you know? Um, we've got, uh, you know, calendar and we've got spreadsheet or we've got many other utilities for time management. But because it has a specific use and it's a new expression, it's in an app and it's for mothers, it could be a new innovative step. So the short answer here, Mandy, is like, I, I would recommend you, you take the advantage of a one hour consultation, just so I can understand uh, the subject matter of whether it's paintable or not. It's actually too few details for me to give you a qualified opinion. But I do believe in technology that the innovation side, the new and innovative step can make technology, um, uh, technology uh, patentable. And it's often a good way to go. And I know this also because one of the other um, partners that work uh, in conjunction with IP Assist, his name, uh, he's, he's a patent attorney. He's by the name of Mr. Steve Davey. Steve um, is actually an entrepreneur as well. And he has developed technology software that he has patented as an innovative innovation patent. So I would in, encourage you to spend some more time around that. And then you'll be able to just simply come up with an IP strategy around the patent. And one other answer to that, Mandy, just before we finish off, um, is that while it might not be uh, protected by a patent, one of the things that's going to be very relevant to you is even, even if it isn't a patent, is still to ensure that your, the licensing terms and conditions um, are, are protected. And what I mean by that is the power of contracts. We're here talking about intellectual property, but it's really important to also understand that intellectual property exists also with the power of contracts, okay? And a simple way of actually understanding this is actually to look at the terms and conditions that you sign into to use Facebook, that you sign into and agree uh, to use Canva. These, this is actually contract, uh, a contract that you sign to use these applications and it's really important to get those nuts and bolts right as well. Um, and often, if you can't protect it with a patent, you can protect it in other ways through the power of contracts. And I'm going to I'm just end on that uh, in today's session. I didn't want to overwhelm you. So look, just to round off this section, Mandy, I hope that helps. And, and certainly do feel free to register for a time. Oh, there you go. Thanks. I hope that's okay for now. Now, Andrew, do you want to introduce some of our... Um, so thought leaders, um, some, some ideas uh, yep. on how to present um, some business owners, some colourful examples. Yeah, so we, we have a couple of uh, other mentions here, which I, I might, I reckon this might be useful for a number of the different businesses that are here. So um, Lorne has mentioned if you uh, trademark, sorry, can we just get... Some, just the mute, yeah. 
you, thanks guys. Um, if you, what have we got here? We've got, if you trademark your personal name, does it limit media from using, uh, using your name without your permission? Uh, and also is the use of copyright 2020 along with business name on any documents produced, is this protection or is there more required? Can you say that again? Sorry, I just want to- Okay, remember. let's start with the first one. If you uh, trademark your personal name, does this limit the media from using your name without your permission? Yes, it does protect you. Uh, under the Trademarks Act 1995, uh, the trademark, having a registered trademark allows you to distinguish yourself from all other traders in the marketplace. So having a registered trademark will give you the full and exclusive right to use that name in the marketplace for a period of 10 years. And what that means is that if you have that registered trademark and another trader uses it, you have the power under the Trademarks Act to serve a cease and desist notice to actually um, have them uh, desist from using it in the marketplace and possible injunctive relief. And so what that means is basically, yes, you have the, the, the full power to use it and exploit it in the marketplace in Australia. And it's why one of my hard recommendations is to ensure that you do protect your trademark because it might, you might not be enforcing it or, or, or make huge steps in the next six months, but you will in the next 10 years. And that's the power of protecting your brand. Beautiful, fantastic. The next question we've got here as well is, is the use of copyright 2020 along with business name uh, on any documents produced, is this enough protection or is more required? Okay, very good question as well. Again, I'll refer back to trademarks. Only a trademark gives you full legal right to the use of that name in the marketplace. I will repeat it again because it's, it's one of the biggest... Um, it's one of the mis misconceptions that you have the business name registered uh, and that you have um, the domain registered, therefore you have the legal right. You do not. Only a trademark will give you the full power to use it. And even though you've got a business name registration, it, it really does, it is not worth, uh, it is not, does not give you the legal right and ownership of that name. It basically comes down to this, is that you would not be driving your car without your car licensed. So therefore you should not be driving your business without protecting your most visible intellectual property, which is your brand. Only a, brand, only a trademark will give you the full legal right and protection. The business name, the proprietary limited gut name, the domain name, do not give you legal protect use of the name, okay? Great, that's a great, great question and great answer. Thank you. Let's give Lorna a bit of love. Three, two, one. Thanks, Lorna. Uh, now going over to, um, to Dia. Dia says, in video production, if I produce a video or create a DVD as a service of my company, for another company, whose IP is it? Who owns the IP? Who owns the footage slash raw footage uh, if it's uh, the finished product only um, was sold as a service? Oh, great question, you know, and, and from someone that has a media background myself, it, it, it's, it's a really interest, this question, because whether you're a wedding photographer or whether you're a video uh, creator, um, first of all, let me just touch on a photographer's example, because you know, weddings are a huge industry um, uh, and often the photographer is one of the first person to be hired. Um, and they actually, many wedding photographers, take the photo of your most special day for the love of your story and then they will actually own the copyright and actually only license you the right to those images, which I believe is slightly, I just find that it's a little bit, uh, you know, there's a heavy hand of ownership of copyright protection right there. Technically speaking, a photographer, an iPhone uh, photographer or a, uh, a, or a professional photographer, you know, you, if you take that photo, you have the ownership of that, of those, um, uh, those images. Uh, however, if you're putting them onto Facebook, you're actually assigning away the rights in those images. So a wedding photographer, what often they do in their contract is that they get the couple to agree for only a certain amount of, uh, of time, for only a certain amount of prints. And if you want additional prints, they will license additional prints to you, but you will never actually own the copyright in your own image. 
which I feel finds incredible. If we now move that to film and television, in video production, often you as the video creator are responsible for what is called the chain of title. And that is the, the range of contracts that have to be uh, put in place. Say this was a short film, a Hollywood film or otherwise, it would be you, the producer, that has to get all the rights, including the actors, the, uh, the script writer, the technical team, and you would scoop all those rights up and then sell them back to a studio, okay? Um, and in the case of digital production, it's actually similar, but it's, we, we, we don't want to overcomplicate it. The answer to your question is, is that you are, you are normally in creative businesses, if you are selling your services, then there should be a contract a last, where you're actually assigning in return for payment the images to the owner. That goes for marketers as well. There should be something in your terms and conditions, your contract, with your customers that actually assigns the intellectual property, the copyright to uh, the person that has actually paid for them. That's just the easiest way to deal with copyright uh, in terms of film, video production, marketing, is that it, technically, if somebody is employing you to make them some images, to make them a film, then you should transfer the copyright back to them. And that, um, and, and that should be documented by way of a terms and conditions or a contract with your clients. I hope that answers the question. Um, but, if, but if for some reason, uh, well, if a contract was never made, um, in that case, like I, pro I pro provided a DVD for them uh, of a finished product two, almost two years ago, and now they're wanting um, a file so that they can break it up and sell it okay. a different way. Mm. Um, they're saying that they own the IP because I had no creative input, which I use my camera, my lights, my audio. I provided a service and just used their, their branding and created the DVD. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think what this points to the headline issue here is actually having this last area, this fourth area that we have, we'll touch on right at the end. It's actually ensuring that you have terms and conditions in place around your intellectual property. It often becomes a problem um, if nothing's in place, if you do not have a trademark in place, if you haven't gone to the trouble of, you know, establishing copyright over your materials, if you don't have clear paper trails leading back to your terms. One of the other fundamental ground floor rights that I can actually, uh, as you know, the th third key takeaway, if you like, if, if, if nothing else, is to ensure that you have uh, proper terms and conditions in place, okay? If you're a video creator, that means having terms and conditions that you have a client sign off or agree to before you commence work. If you're in property, property developers and others are much better at this, um, then you're making sure that a contract is signed before you lease or begun, you know, the chain of title of a, of a, of a major um, property development. If you are a consultant, it's important to have a consulting agreement or at the very least terms and conditions that cover you for not only intellectual property and how that intellectual property will be treated. For example, you may be building something. It could be a piece of software for someone as a, pro as an, as a software developer. You need to have and establish a chain of title and that's contained within your terms and condition because the example that we're just seeing cited here is actually, it's, it's unclear, it's murky because no document was put in place at the beginning. And that's the key takeaway to have here. Well, it's not that, um, like you said, with the photography, the wedding photography, it's not that I automatically own it, it just needed to be in place. Like, that's right. Uh, like they that's can't right. I think that, me because mm -hmm. I use their um, imagery to create a video but I, I took all of the video. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting one too because one of the other things when you're filming, uh, you know, whether you're uh, on the set of The Apprentice or uh, if you're making a wedding video, it's like you're actually taking people's image, right? Now, Andrew would have signed a contract. I have no doubt at some stage we'd said that The uh, Apprentice uh, can use, uh, use his image uh, and in order for him to be in the program. With this example, um, we're actually hearing about, you know, you've used some, you used a brand, you've used images. Um, 
again, you know, the short answer to this, and I'm happy to spend more time as part of a consultation, but the short answer to this is there needs to be clear chain of title flying through the uh, project, which shows that you can use that footage, you know, because you took it from Pixabay or, you know, and licensed that that was free to use. Or, uh, you know, you did a deal, a brand deal with Andrew Morello to appear in your, your, late, your next corporate film. You know, at the end of the day, it is a complex web of rights, but I'm happy to spend more time because at, at the end of the day, we're just trying, I'm trying to give you a foundation in intellectual yeah. property as well. Sorry, part. Gareth, Gareth, just on that, because I, I know I'm vigilant of people's time as well. And sure. what, what we can do, guys, this is what I recommend. Um, I'm going to get Leo to pop uh, Gareth's link up in the uh, chat right now. And that is an opportunity for you to book an obligation-free complimentary half an hour, 45, 60 minute chat with uh, Gareth. I think you all should take advantage of that. That's uh, Gareth's time is very valuable from a monetary point of view and also from a uh, knowledge point of view. So if you want to just pop that in, Leo, have you got that, Leo? I don't have access to oh. Gareth's calendar actually, but- Gareth, did you want to pop it in? I got Pop it. the link into the comments there. So I recommend everybody does that. And then what we'll do is whilst you guys are doing that, I might actually just get Craig West to um, say a couple of words for, for 30 seconds to a minute just on our event that we've got on the 4th of August. So similar to this, a masterclass with another amazing expert being Craig West. Um, I've worked with Craig for the last 11 years. Um, literally, it, we, the Entourage and uh, Succession Plus were had the shared an office back in the... Uh, the back streets of Sydney, once upon a time, 11 years ago, when Jack and I were just starting out. Um, Craig's been a wonderful supporter of the entourage and also um, of entrepreneurs and, and especially uh, uh, entourage entrepreneurs. So, um, Craig, do you want to just give people a bit of a rundown of what, what we're doing while people are booking their session with Gareth um, on the link? Uh, Gareth, have you popped that in there? Just one yeah, second. It's, it's in there now. So, yeah, uh, it's a calendar link and it's basically... No, it hasn't come up. It hasn't come up in the chat. Has anyone else got it? Hang on. There it is. There it is. Okay, there great. Is. Beautiful. Guys, feel free to click on that while uh, we listen to um, what Craig's going to be going through on the 4th of August with me in the Masterclass. Craig. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Marilla. Um, look, I think there's a really big uh, opportunity at the moment with... Uh, COVID, we've, we've actually had three record months in a row, which is pretty unbelievable because there's a lot of people that are struggling with COVID, but it's all off the back of employee share plans. So my research, I've basically just about finished um, doctoral studies in using employee share plans for Australian businesses. And they're for two key things. One is to lock people in. If you've got key employees, particularly key employees at the moment that are working remotely from home or working in a separate office from where you are, then having those people really focused on your business and motivated to perform the same way that you are. I always tell people, imagine if you had 20 staff thinking and acting like you do about your own business. If you had 20 people thinking like business owners in your business, you will get better financial results. There's no doubt about it. And uh, that's part of what we're going to talk about. The other part of what we're going to talk about is how you get that mindset and alignment between the business owner the business and the employees, because often there's a bit of a clash there. Often there's a little bit of a, you know, cross-cultural thing happening with an us and them type focus. What we're going to do is show you how to use an employee share plan to align that so that it's a win-win-win. My view is if you put these in properly, the business should be better off, the owners should or founders should be better off, and the employees should be better off. That's what we're going to talk about uh, next month. Looking forward to it. That's on the 4th of August at 10 a.m., guys. Uh, 4th of August at 10 a.m. Uh, you can actually click, is that what you've just put up, Leo? You put the link for that one. So the link that Leo has just put up, um, if you want to register for that, if you're not quite sure if you're going to be available on the 4th of August at 10 a.m., what I recommend is register, um, just so we can be vigilant of numbers and, and work out what we're doing and, and the sort of break down exactly how that's going to work. Um, and, uh, and obviously if you can't make that event, then you can let us know. Um, okay. Uh, Dia needs, Dia, is, is that you saying you need to go? Are you leaving? No. Okay. You're just saying, thank you very much. Okay. No, no worries. Wonderful. Um, and if, for those who are, Gareth, have you got some bookings that are coming through yeah, there? Uh, oh, look, I'll have to double check, but listen, um, I might, I'll do a follow up just in terms of the emails for the registrants and, uh, later on this afternoon, if you miss this link now, I'm also happy to share the slides at the end of the day, 
um, understanding the value of your ideas and actually um, and putting yourself in the best position possible as an entrepreneur. I'm really happy to spend 60 minutes with uh, everyone on the call in the next two weeks uh, to actually go through the IP, go through that worksheet. And so you've got a really good understanding of the, the value of your trademark, your copyright, and this last part that I just touched on today, the value of licensing your most invaluable asset, which is your ideas. I'd just like to thank everyone. And, um, and thank you, Andrew, for hosting today. It's great to be part of the entourage in which uh, entrepreneurship is fulfilled. Beautiful, thank you very much, Gareth. Can we give Gareth a bit of love, guys? Three, two, one, great. And uh, just in closing, guys, as well, Leo has um, put in my Once Hub uh, uh, calendar link. So if you'd like to know more about the Entourage, if you're not an existing Entourage member, I know a number of you are that are on the call, but if you'd like to know more about the Entourage, you can feel free to click on that link and book in a complimentary obligation free session with me as well. Uh, directly having a bit of a chat through that. Um, we do have a couple of other questions, Gary. Look, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I wanted to make sure we have got in all of the, the ducks in a row before 11.30, because I know some yeah, people yeah. have got children and, 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 and okay, holidays and, and school teachings right now. But um, we don't need to rush off. Uh, Gareth's happy to stick around. Are you right, Gareth? You're happy to stick around? Yep. So obviously, um, you've got the link there for Gareth, guys. You've got the link for Craig West and my masterclass on the 11th, uh, on the 4th of uh, August. And also you've got my personal link there. But um, let me go back to a couple of the questions. My cousin, Anthony Morello from Nidri, has said, is it possible to patent a unique concept for an event? Okay, that's okay. That one. Now, Rachel, uh, Sorry, someone who's got wind in the background, just bear with me. Who's, who's it's Rachel? Can you mute her, please? I, 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 I've muted it. It's fine. Great. Okay, great. Um, so just in relation to events, um, yeah, events, I, I think, again, this would probably be worth spending some time on because unless, until I get a full understanding of what the concept is, it, it's hard for me to actually answer, answer it in uh, full detail. But what I can uh, can say is that um, with events, I believe it will be around the contracts uh, and the licensing of your IP that's going to be really important. An event doesn't typically tend to be, an ex you'll have a brand, but then that will be a trademark. There'll be a lot of copyright in and in, in your you know your, your plans for major events. But actually, what's going to be very key is uh, in is is how that event. Uh, is conducted and how you sell tickets around the events. And it's actually going to be in the commercial contract. And um, I think that that's going to be very, 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 very important. Uh, and that's how you'll protect the intellectual property as well as gain commercial advantage out of it. It's going to be in the power of your contracts. That's the easy answer to that question. But again, I encourage you to set up a time and we'll have a bit more of a chat about it. Great, a bit of love for Anthony Morello. Three, two, one. Great, Martin Galea, do you have a question? No, I'm, um, I'm happy with all the discussion that's occurred. And okay, no worries, I thought you were ready. putting a little electronic hand up. No, 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 no. Um, just, I need um, to say goodbye to everyone. On the oh, minute. okay, no worries. Thanks for joining us, say, Martin. Yeah. Beautiful, look forward to catching up soon. Uh, Max, uh, Max's question is for logo trademarks, it, it, it also does it also protect the words in the logo, for example, Heart Safe Australia, Heart Safe Hotels, the logos include the words. Very good question. Um, and I did see that, uh, that I was trying to bring up the um, bring up that graphic. But look, the answer is that the Trademarks Act 1995 correct, uh, protects uh, the, the, all the elements of a badge of origin. So one of the other um, quick tips I can share with you there is like, when you are, um, you know, seeking guidance on, on trademark protection. Um, then the name's not only important, but actually you can protect the logo, uh, the name, and even a tagline. So all those things can be a combination of elements that serves to protect you and distinguish your brand uh, uh, compared to all others. It then becomes more a badge of origin because your Nike, the Swoop, and the Just Do It are three different components of their brand, but all together they are a badge of origin of Nike. In a similar way with the Heart Institute, um, if I've got the name right, is that it, it could protect the logo, the name, the brand, the colours, 
um, and all those elements combined. And again, it's why it's good to get some professional advice uh, when you're planning this stage, because not only can I assist you in, in, in making sure that the, the trademark is free to register. I mean, if you've got a competitor in the name, this is often when people misstep. They don't do the research. They go out to business. They think they have the domain. And then they find out there's someone else with identical name who's been around for 10 years longer. And they've got to pivot their name in three in 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 uh, and they're three year, years into their business. So it's about the proper planning. And with that particular example, again, I'd, I'd recommend you set up to time with me. But but the short answer is to protect the collection of those uh, of all those elements and protect them as a badge of origin. Uh, as well. My my cousin off the back of that um, Gareth has said. So this means, Andrew, you should trademark the simple boy from the back. Yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> that's it's right. Probably... Yeah, you should get in, but then I could pivot because I'd be like the boy from the bush and you'd be the boy from the birds. Uh, correct, and... correct, exactly. Correct, exactly. Um, uh, first, thank you very much, Max, for that question. For those of you who don't know Max's, um, uh, Max's business, it is absolutely fantastic. Um, so maybe put the link in Max for people to have a look in the in the chat. And he's Max is also a new Entourage member. And Max, I don't know if you've met um, Steve before, Mr. Mark and Michelle, uh, and Gareth. You guys are all members, so uh, you know, make sure you guys do catch up um, and so forth. But uh, what else have I got here? Um, a test needs to go, but he's looking forward to uh, catching up with you, Gareth. I think he's already. Done the initial catch up. Um, Lorna has booked in a session with you, uh, and she's also booked in a session with me this afternoon. Um, right. Uh, all right. I reckon that might be it, guys. I think we're we're on track there. Um, so, guys, thank you very much for interacting and, and being a part of it. I uh, really appreciate your, uh, and she's also Lorna's also booked in for the master. You've done a triple bogey, Lorna. You are flat out. And I'm looking forward to catching up. Um, uh, so, guys, thank you so much, uh, first of all, for everyone attending. Um, we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules. Um, I, I completely, my sentiments uh, are absolutely um, in line with Gareth's in that, you know, disruption is an opportunity. Um, I think right now, more than ever, there's some there's some real opportunities in the market. And, and you know, number two is leaning into, you know, great advice and, Great opportunities to speak to uh, amazing people that uh, that have knowledge in in particular sectors. I actually just had a text from um, somebody who couldn't make it today, Gareth, saying, "Are you running the session or or what?" I'm like, "No, I've got it professionally," and they're like, "You're not very good at law," and I'm like, it's, "I don't need to be good at law because I've got the best people that are good at law as my advisors in life." And that's the way I've I, got you know, your, I've got you back, man. I'm here's my point. Our I, own brand. I, I, I always explain to people that the, you know, the whole, the old Henry Ford, whether you like Henry Ford or not, I know it's controversial once you actually start to delve into his history, but um, Henry Ford, you know, got, took the, um, took the New York Times uh, to court for defamation because they called him a, uh, a, you know, they, they said he was ignorant and he just got lucky and um, he didn't actually invent the car. And, you know, but he was, you know, proclaiming that he basically, you know, was the, the, the grandfather of, of the innovation. And uh, when they got up, the defence lawyer for the New York Times went and said to, um, you know, said to, uh, um, said to, you know, to, to Henry Ford up on the stand, he said, you know, in, in 1861, who was the, um, who was the, 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 the colonel that battled the war in X, Y, Z? And he's like, I don't know. And then he's like, what's the square root of X, Y, Z? And he's like, I don't know. And so the New York Times, the defense lawyer said, well, I've just proven that it's not, um, it's not defamation because you actually don't know uh, very much. And, you know, I, by me calling you ignorant, it's, I've proven that you are ignorant by New York Times calling you that. And he goes, I'm actually the smartest person in the room. And he goes, why do you say I'm the smartest, you're the smartest person in the room? Because any time of the day, 24 hours a day, I have a button on my desk 
and I can bring five people in that will answer all of those questions for me. So on that sentiment, I'd like to thank Gareth Benson for his wonderful presentation. Uh, I'd like to recommend you all to, uh, to touch base with him directly and, and uh, have that session with him. I think you'll get a lot out of it. Um, thank you, Gareth, for your ongoing support with regard to not just the my business um, works, but also my philanthropic works. That's even more important to me. So thank you for your continued support in that department. And I look forward to uh, the, uh, the gates of Cambodia reopening for us so we can go over and see uh, the kids over at the orphanages over in Cambodia. Um, the boy from the bush has gone to the boy from Moody Ponds. Back, a pleasure to assist. Beautiful. Thank you very much, guys. Have a wonderful day. Um, as mentioned, there's all those links there for you. And uh, stay classy, Santiago. But most of all, keep living the drum. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. Thanks, guys.